Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the gift of life. I, th I thank you so much for the Sabbath day that you have blessed us with. <clears throat> and I thank you so much that we are able to be here, that we are able to worship together online. And Lord, as we just take this time to study your word, as we take this time to look into the scriptures and to listen to your voice speaking to us, I just pray that you would send the Holy Spirit to be here. I pray that you would speak to each one of us. I pray that you would convict us, you would challenge us. And I pray that you would please draw close to us and allow us to feel your presence at this time. And so, Lord, I just want to surrender um, every person that is listening into your hands. And I pray that you would be with me as I speak as well. May you speak through me and may this message truly touch our hearts because you are the one who is speaking to us. I thank you so much for hearing and answering our prayers. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of my sermon this morning is Shaken at Times. It's the phrase shaken at times. Now, when you read the Bible, you will find that there's really only one place where you find this phrase shaken at times. Do you know where it is? Do you know where you can find this phrase? You can find this phrase in the story of Samson. <clears throat> and so this morning, I want to share with you from the story of Samson. I want to share with you this very familiar story. Because, you know, many times when we think about the story of Samson, when we listen to the story of Samson, or when we share about the story of Samson, we always focus on one thing. And you know what's the thing we focus on? We focus on his, on how he is so strong, but yet he's so weak. And you know what is his weakness that we talk about? It's his lust. You know, it's his relationship issues. You know, the, the story of Samson is very fami familiar to us. In fact, even kids know this story. You know, I grew up listening to the story, and, and I bet you that almost every kid knows about the story of Samson. But you see, what always comes out is his weakness in, in the area of lust. It's his weakness toward women. It's his weakness in his relationship. You know, we always focus on the problem of lust. However, this morning, as we look at the story of Samson, I want to propose to you that lust is not his main issue. That was not his main problem. Yes, that was part of his issue, but that was not his main problem. There was something deeper that Samson was struggling with. You see, there was a root, root issue that, was, that Samson was struggling with, and lust and relationship was just the fruits of that deeper issue. So this morning, I want to share with you what his main problem was, what the main struggle, the main issue of Samson was. And you will see that you can relate to Samson because it's not just about relationships. It's not just about lust. It's not just about women. No, friends, Samson had a deeper issue that all of us as Christians today can relate to. Well, let's begin in the book of Judges chapter 13, as we look at the birth of Samson, the birth and the purpose of Samson. Judges chapter 13 and verse 1, the Bible says this, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered their, them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. Now, when you read the book of Judges, you will find something very interesting. You will find that during the time of the Judges, there was a lot of spiritual apostasy among God's people. You know, the, the, the book of Judges describes the condition of the people like this. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. You see, everyone was living according to how they felt was best for them. They were not living according to the Word of God. They were not living according to the commands of God. No, they were living according to their own pleasures, their own lust, according to what they thought and felt was best for their lives. And so everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And there was a lot of spiritual apostasy, a lot of people turning from God and living in sin. But what would God do? You see, in this time of spiritual apostasy, God did not leave them alone. No, God raised up judges. 
And the purpose of these judges was so that they could bring the people back to God, so that they can turn the people back to obeying God and worshiping Him and keeping His law. So God raised up the judges. And when God would raise up the judges, guess what? The people would repent. They would turn back to God. They would worship God again. They would come back to the true obedience of the Creator. But guess what happens when the judge would die? Yes, you guessed it. The people would go back almost immediately to their sins. And so in the book of Judges, you find this up and down religious life of the people. When God raised the judges, the people were up here. They were on fire for God. They were faithful. But as soon as the judge died, the people began to live in sin again. And so people in the book of Judges, they had a spiritual roller coaster. They were living in sin. Sometimes they were faithful and sometimes they were not. Sometimes they obeyed God. Sometimes they disobeyed Him. And so they had this spiritual inconsistency in their lives. And here in Judges chapter 13, it is no different because the Bible begins here by telling us that the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. You see, after the death of Abdon in Judges chapter 12, the people went back to their sins. They went back to their old life and they began to turn away from God. They began to live in sin once more. And what did God do here in verse 1? Judges chapter 13 verse 1 tells us that God delivered the, the people of Israel, the children of Israel, into the hands of the Philistines. For how long? For 40 years. You see, God's people had not learned a lesson yet, and so God had to teach them once again. He had to deliver them into the hands of the Philistines once more. He needed to teach them the lesson that they were not learning. But what happened next? Let's continue. Let's go to Judges chapter 13, verses 2 and 3. The Bible says this, And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. So what does the Bible tell us here? There was a man, man whose name was Manoah, who lived in the town of Zorah. And the Bible tells us that his wife was barren. She had no child. She could not bear any child. But here in verses 2 and 3, an angel of the Lord comes to Manoah's wife and tells his wife, what? That she would bear a son. That she would bear a child. But what about this child does the Bible tell us? What does the Bible tell us about this child? Let's continue in verses 4 and 5. It says, Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean, th unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. What I want you to notice here is that before uh, Manoah's wife could bear the child, the angel gave he, her very specific instructions to follow. What did the angel tell her? Firstly, the angel told her not to drink wine or strong drink. And the second thing the angel told her was not to eat any unclean thing. And also the angel told her that this child that she would bear, his hair should not be cut. No razor should come upon the head of this child. In other words, don't ever cut his hair. It was to grow long. But now, why? The question is, why was, the, why was Manoah's wife given these instructions? You see, we have to understand this fact. Manoah's wife was to bear a son who would be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. That's what the Bible tells us. And this child would be used by God to deliver his people out of the hand of the Philistines. This child had a special purpose. This child had a special mission from God. And so from the womb, he had to be a Nazarite. Now, do you know what the word Nazarite means? 
What does that word mean? When you look in the concordance, the word Nazarite means to be separated or consecrated. Yes, that's what it means, to be separated or consecrated. That is the original meaning of the word Nazarite. And you see, we begin to understand why the angel gave her very specific instructions. This child that she was to bear was to be separated. He was to be different. He was to be consecrated unto God. And it had to begin from the womb. Not when he was born, not when he was older. No, it had to begin from the womb. And so it had to begin from the mother. She had to watch her diet. She had to watch her lifestyle. She had to make sure that she was not eating any unclean thing or drinking any strong drink. But you see, God wanted to separate Samson for a holy use and purpose. God had a very specific mission for Samson. He had a specific plan for his life. And so God saw the need for this child, for Samson to be separated and consecrated. God wanted to use Samson to, del to deliver his people from the hands of the enemies. But God knew that before he could use Samson, Samson needed to be consecrated, separated. Or we can say that Samson needed to be sanctified. You see, God wanted Samson to be different. But what's interesting to me is that the angel told the mother of Samson not to drink any wine or strong drink and not to eat any unclean thing, just so that Samson could be consecrated. You see, this is very interesting to me. It's because out of all the things that the angel could have told the mother to do, it started with what? Don't drink any wine, don't drink any, don't eat any unclean thing. Now, if you were to summarize these two things, what would you call it? It's diet. It's lifestyle. It's health reform. You see, many times when we talk about consecration, we talk about separation, we talk about being sanctified, it begins with these things. You know, before we go into bigger things, many times it begins with what we eat, what we drink, the way we dress. You know, it's those little things that to us doesn't, you know, doesn't seem like a big thing. It doesn't seem like it matters to God, but to God, it's a big thing. It's very important to God. You see, in a similar way, just like God wanted Samson to be separated and consecrated, God wants the same for us as well. God's plan for you and I is to be different from the rest of the world. God has a specific plan and purpose for our lives. God wants us to be separated and consecrated. He wants us to be different. God has a holy purpose for our lives. Notice what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Notice here, the Bible says that we are what? We are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. And then it says we are a peculiar people. Now that word peculiar doesn't mean that we are strange or weird. No, we are just different. We have to be different from the rest of the world. Why? So that we can be a light in this world of darkness. You see, God's plan and purpose for us was never to blend in with the world. It was never to mingle with them and to be like them. No, we are to stand apart. We are to be different. We are to show the difference between light and darkness. God wants us to be separated. He wants us to be consecrated. He wants us to be different all together. He wants us to be a light to this world of darkness. And you see, just like Samson, God wants to use you and I today to deliver His people from the enemy. And no, we, don't, we do not fight with the physical enemy. We fight more with the spiritual enemy. We fight with principalities and powers. And today, God is wanting to use us to deliver His people from the hands of, of the enemy. But remember, before God can, can use you, before God can use me, we must be consecrated. We must be separated. We must be 
sanctified. And in the case of Samson, and many times in the ca- it's the same for us, it begins with diet. It begins with what we eat and drink. It begins with the choices we make in our dress. It begins with the way we choose to, to live our lives. You see, many times we look at diet as a small thing. You know, God doesn't care about what I eat. God is not so narrow-minded, you know, to to not use me because of the way I'm eating and drinking. God is God doesn't care about those things. He only cares about the big things, right? As long as I go to church and I pay my tithe and I'm faithful, I'm keeping the Sabbath, God can use me. Doesn't matter what I eat and drink, right? Well, in the case of Samson, we see that that's not, that's not true. God specifically told the mother not to eat any unclean thing and not to drink any strong drink. You see, friends, God is very concerned with our diet. He's very concerned with our lifestyle. He's very concerned with the little things in our lives that may seem insignificant to us, but to God it's very important. Many times it's those little things that hinder God from using us. And so today God wants us to be consecrated separated. But what are those little things that God is showing us? What are those things that He's showing us that we need to change, that we need to give up, that we need to come up higher? What are those little changes that we need to make? You see, many times it begins with our diet. Is your diet, is your lifestyle hindering God from using you to be a blessing? Is your diet and your lifestyle and your dress hindering you from experiencing full sanctification? That's a question that only you can answer. That's a question that only you can reflect upon and something that you have to take between you and God. But now let's go back to the story of Samson. Let's jump down to verse 24. Judges chapter 13, verse 24, the Bible says this, And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. So here the Bible tells us that the woman, Manoah's wife, bore a son and called his name Samson. Now, do you know what the word Samson means? When you look at the original meaning of the the name Samson, it means sun, S-U-N, or sunlight. So you see, Samson's purpose was to be like what? He was to be like the sun. The S-U-N. He was to be like this. He was to be, you know, like sunlight. To produce light. To shed light in a world of darkness. That was his purpose. That was God's plan for Samson. But you see, Samson did not have light on his own. Who is the true source of light? Let's see what the Bible tells us. Psalms 84 verse 11. The Bible says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from them that walk uprightly. So you see, the Bible tells us that God is a sun and shield. You see, Samson, his, uh, his purpose in life was to reflect that light that came directly from God. He was, to, he, he was to be connected with God so that he can receive that light and he can reflect that light to the people in darkness. And the Bible also says in Psalms 84 verse 11 that God is a shield. Remember that Samson was to be used by God to deliver his people out of the hands of the Philistines. He was to be a shield for them. He was to be their protector, their defender, their deliverer. This was the purpose of Samson. This was why God chose Samson to be a light, to to shed the light that would come from God and to be a shield for his people. But now, I want you to notice what the Bible tells us about Samson. In the following verse, in verse 25, the Bible says this, And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtiel. What does the Bible say here? I want you to notice very carefully. It says, The Spirit of the Lord began to move Samson. How often? It says there, at times. Now, do you know what the phrase at times mean? It means now and then. It means on and off. It means sometimes. It means occasionally. What does it tell us? It was not consistent. 
You see, Samson was separated and consecrated from the womb. He had a very specific purpose in his life. God had a mission and purpose for him. And God blessed him as he grew. But the Bible tells us here that the Spirit of the Lord could only move him at times. Even though Samson was consecrated and sanctified, and he, the Lord blessed him with the holy purpose and mission, the Holy Spirit could only move him sometimes. Now and then, on and off, occasionally, Samson lacked spiritual consistency and stability. Samson, while he could have experienced the moving of the Holy Spirit all the time, he only experienced it at times. You see, there were times that Samson would be under the guidance and direction of the Holy Spirit, where he would live according to the convictions that the Holy Spirit is placing in his life. And there are times when he would harden his heart against those convictions, where he would live according to his own pleasures, where he would live in sin according to how he felt was best for his life. While Samson could be moved by the Holy Spirit consistently, the Holy Spirit could only move him sometimes. You see, Samson's life was like a spiritual roller coaster. Sometimes it was up, sometimes he was on fire for God, and sometimes it was down. Sometimes he would turn away from God, sometimes he would disobey God altogether. There was no consistency and no stability. Friends, can you relate to Samson? Do you find that your Christian life is like that? Sometimes you're up, you're on fire for God, you're faithful, you're serving Him, and there are times where you are living in sin. You are living according to your own pleasures. You are hardening your heart against the convictions that God is placing upon you. Can you relate to that? There are times where you would live according to God's Word. Live according to the commands that He has placed in His Word. And there are times where you would forsake His Word, forsake His commands, and live according to the standard of the world. You see, this was the experience of Samson. This was his struggle. This was his problem. But what was his issue? Why was it that the Holy Spirit could only move Samson at times? Now, let me make something clear. It was not the fault of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit can save. The Holy Spirit can move us. The Holy Spirit can work in and through us. But it depends on how much we are willing to allow the Holy Spirit to work. The reason why the Holy Spirit could only move Samson at times was because there was something that was hindering the Holy Spirit to work. There was something in his life that was causing a hindrance. There was something that Samson was doing that would stop the Holy Spirit from working. And so friends, when the Holy Spirit cannot work in your life and mine, it's not because the Holy Spirit is insufficient or the Holy Spirit does not have the capability to do so. No, many times it's because of us. It's the decisions, the choices we make that either allow the Holy Spirit to work or cause him to stop. But what was the issue of Samson? What was his problem? What was that one thing that was causing the Holy Spirit to not be able to move him at all times? Well, let's continue reading and let's find out. Let's go to Judges chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. Notice what the Bible says. It says, And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. Judges chapter 14 begins by telling us that Samson went down to Timnath. Now Timnath was in the area of the Philistines. It was a land in the Philistines. You see, this was the first thing that led to the downfall of Samson. The first mistake that Samson made was that he began to go down. Instead of going up, he began to go down. He began to go to where the Philistines dwelt. He began to mingle with them. He wanted to see what life was like there. He wanted to see what the Philistines were like, wanted to make friends with them, wanted to see how they were living their lives. 
he began to mingle with them, began to go to the other side. Remember that God wanted him to be separated and consecrated, but here Samson is seen mingling with them. He begins to go away from God and towards the enemy. Samson began to dwell in the land of the Philistines. And while Samson was there, the Bible tells us that he saw a Philistine woman. And when he saw this woman, he went back to his parents and told his parents that, you know, he said, Mom, Dad, this is the, par- this is the wife, this is the girl that I want to marry. Get her for me to wife. Now, how did Samson's parents respond to this? Well, let's continue reading and let's find out. Judges chapter th- uh, 14, verse 3. The Bible says this, Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all my people, that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. So how did Samson's parents react to this the request of Samson? Of course, they questioned his decision. They said, why can't you find a wife, a girl from our people here, from among God's people, from our land here? Why must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to find a wife? They questioned him. They helped him to see that this decision that he had made was wrong, that it was irrational, that he was making a mistake. But what did Samson answer his parents? The only answer that Samson gave was this, Get her for me, because she pleaseth me well. That's that's all he answered. Get her for me, she pleases me well. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you think that there were no beautiful girls there in the land of Israel? Do you think that among God's people, there were no beautiful women? I highly doubt so. I think that there were many beautiful women among God's people. And when we talk about this Philistine woman, you know, I didn't, could it be that this, this Philistine woman was the most beautiful girl that Samson saw? Do you think that he was captivated by her beauty alone? Do you think that she was the most beautiful girl at the time and Samson saw her beauty and said, I want that girl. She's the most beautiful girl. I, I, I don't think so. You see, the Bible doesn't even tell us that this girl was beautiful. You know, many times in the Bible, when when a woman is beautiful, the Bible mentions it. It says that the woman was very fair to look upon. The Bible doesn't even tell us that this woman was beautiful. So I highly doubt, I believe that, you know, her beauty was not what attracted Samson. Samson did not want her just because she was beautiful, just because she was beautiful the most attractive woman. I don't think so. I don't think that was the reason and the motivation why he wanted this woman. Well then, why was it that Samson was so attracted to this woman? Why was it that he was so pleased by this woman and wanted to marry her? Well, I want you to notice what Ellen White says in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, 562 paragraph two. She says, but association with idolaters corrupted him. The town of Zorah being near the country of the Philistines, Samson came to mingle with them on friendly terms. Thus in his youth, intimacy sprang up, the influence of which darkened his whole life. A young woman dwelling in the Philistine town of Timnath engaged Samson's affections, and he determined to make her his wife. To his God-fearing parents, who endeavored to dissuade him from his purpose, his only answer was, She pleaseth me well. The parents at last yielded to his wishes, and the marriage took place. You see, Ellen White tells us that Samson began to associate with the Philistines. He began to mingle with them, began to talk with them, began to make friends with them. And their bad influence had a negative effect on his mind. You see, Samson, as he mingled with the Philistines, he began to become just like them. He began to think like the Philistines, began to speak like them. Perhaps he looked at their dress and he began to envy the way they dressed compared to how God's people were dressed. Perhaps he began to eat their food as well, but Samson was slowly becoming one of them. And this is why Samson wanted a Philistine woman. You know, he must have looked at the women in, 
in, in his land. He must have looked at the Israelite women and thought, man, these women are so strange. Look at the way they dress. Look at the way they eat. Look at the way they talk and they, they drank and they ate. It's so weird. It's so strange. But why would Samson think this way? It's because he began to mingle with the Philistines. You know, he must have looked at, at them and thought, man, they're so cool. Look at their dress. Look at the way they bring themselves. I want to be just like them. And he began to look at the Israelite women as someone so strange. Began to look at them as losers. I don't want to be with a woman like that. No, I want a Philistine woman. I want a woman who dresses extravagantly. A woman that talks this way. A woman that eats this way. He was attracted to the Philistines because he started to become one of them. See friends, this was his struggle. This was his issue. Samson wanted a Philistine wife because his values and his principles began to change. His mind began to conform to the ways of the Philistines. He began to become just like one of them. He was attracted to their life and he wanted to live their life. And you see, Samson eventually gets married to this Philistine woman. But now I want you to know this. What happens at the marriage feast? Let's go to Judges chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. The Bible says this. And Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you. If you can certainly declare it within me the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 sheets and 30 change of garments. But if ye cannot declare it me, then shall ye give me 30 sheets and 30 change of garments. And they said unto him, Put forth thy riddle that we may hear it. And he said unto them, Out of the eater, came forth meat, and after the strong came forth sweetness, and they could not in three days expand the riddle. So notice what happens here. At this wedding feast, Samson, you know, he's mingling with the Philistines, he's talking to them, but now he, he has this idea, let me give them a riddle to solve. And he even puts a wager to this challenge. He gives them a riddle and says, if you can solve this riddle within seven days, then I will give you 30 sheets of garments, 30 sheets of clothes. But if you cannot, then you have to give, give me those 30 sheets. But here's the question. Why do you think Samson gave them this riddle? Why do you think he's playing this game with them? Why do you think he threw this challenge at the Philistines? Do you think it's because Samson had no clothes? that he needed clothes, and that's why he thought of this idea to get more clothes? I, I don't think so. I don't think the motivation here for putting forth this riddle was so that he could get those 30 sheets of garments. That was just something that he threw in just to make it fun. But I don't think that that was his motivation. I don't think that the clothes were what he was after. Well then, why was it that he gave this riddle? I believe that the reason why Samson gave this riddle was because he wanted to impress them. You see, Samson was mingling with them and he envied their life and he wanted to be just like them. But more than that, he wanted to impress them. He wanted the Philistines to look up to him. He wanted the Philistines to see, to look at him and think that, man, you're just like us. Wow, you're, you're so smart. You gave us this riddle that we could not solve. And they wanted, he wanted them to worship Him. He wanted them to adore Him, wanted them to praise Him. He was seeking their adoration, seeking their praise, seeking their affirmation. He wanted to be liked by them. And so He gave them this riddle. You see, it could also be that Samson wanted to embarrass them and show them that, you know, even though you're Philistines, I'm still better than you and I'm still above you. But the fact is this, Samson was mingling with them. He wanted their affections. He was still sitting at the table of the enemies and he was talking to them, associating with them. And here while he was talking to them, his guard began, he, he let his guard down. He began to, to, you know, to dance with the devil. He began to, to play a game that he should, have, should not have been playing. Remember that God wanted him to be separated. God wanted him to be consecrated. God wanted him to be different. 
But here he is, sitting at the table of the enemies, eating with them, talking with them, drinking with them, and playing a game with them. Now, I want you to notice what Ellen White tells us about this. In Patriarchs and Prophets, 563 paragraph 3, she says, At his marriage feast, Samson was brought into familiar association with those who hated the God of Israel. Whoever voluntarily enters into such relations will feel it necessary to conform to some degree to the habits and customs of his companions. So notice that Ellen White says that because Samson was there and he was mingling with them, talking with them, it was just natural for him to conform to them, to conform to their ways. And friends, it's the same for us. You see, when we place ourselves in positions where, you know, we are mingling with people who we should not be mingling with, it's just natural for us to conform. Why? Because, you know, when we are talking to people of the world and we are sitting there with them, there's a natural tendency for for us to want them to like us. And so we will conform to their ways. We will talk like them. We will try to gain their affections. We will try to get them to like us. And so our guard is let down. We will begin to conform to the way of the world. But notice what else she says. The time thus spent is worse than wasted. Thoughts are entertained and words are spoken that tend to break down the strongholds of principle and to weaken the citadel of the soul. You see, because of his associations with the Philistines, his principles and values began to change. Samson began to, be, to, uh, began to become spiritually weak. He was conforming to their ways and their example. More and more, Samson was becoming a Philistine, becoming just like one of them, conforming to the ways of the world. But now, notice what happens next. Judges chapter 14, verses 15 and 16. The Bible says, And it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband, that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee and thy father's house with fire. Have ye called us to take what we, that we have? Is it not so? And Samson's wife wept before him and said, Thou dost but hate me and lovest me not. Thou hast put forth the riddle unto the children of my people and, and hast not told it me. And he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father nor my mother, and shall I tell it thee? So what happens here? You see, this riddle was so good that the Philistines could not solve it. And they were getting afraid, they were getting scared, and they said, you know, we don't want to give Samson those 30 sheets of garments. We don't want to lose to this Hebrew. No, we, we don't want to lose. And what did they do? They went to Samson's wife and threatened her. They told her that if you don't get the answer from, from Samson, we will burn you and your father in your house. We will kill you, basically. They threatened her. They were desperate, and this was their last resort. And what did Samson's wife do? She went to Samson and wept before him. She said, you don't love me, you hate me because you have not given me the answer. You have not told me the answer to your riddle. But what is interesting is the way that Samson answered his wife. And I'm going to tell you why it's interesting. But Samson told his wife this, I have not told my mother nor my father the answer, and why should I tell it you? Why should I tell you the answer when I have not even told my parents yet? Now, why is this answer very interesting? Well, I'm going to tell you right now. Let's go to the book of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. Notice what the Bible says. It says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. <clears throat> you see, the Bible tells us that when a man gets married, he will leave his father and mother, and what will he do? He will cleave unto his wife. He will hang on to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. They shall be united. They shall be one mind. You see, when a man gets married, he will leave his father and mother. And now his wife, he must cleave unto her. 
In this case, Samson was married to this woman. And by right, he should have left his father and his mother and he must cleave to his wife. But it's very interesting that Samson did not cleave to her. Why? Why do I say that? It's because when it came to the answer of this riddle, Samson said, I have not told my parents yet. Why should I tell you? In other words, Samson was still cleaving to his parents and not to his wife. They were not one flesh. They were not united. They were not of one mind. You see, even though Samson was married to this woman, he was not connected with her. And so this tells us, that Samson did not really love this woman. He was not married to her because he loved her. He was not married to her because he had that connection with her. He was just married to her because he was attracted. He just wanted to be with her. But when it came to matters like this, when it came to cleaving to his wife, when it came to becoming one flesh, one mind, he could not because he did not really love this woman. See, Samson did not cleave to his wife. He was married to her, but he did not cleave to her. He was still cleaving to his parents. He was just with her, but not really. Just married, but not really connected with her. But why was this? You see, besides the fact that he did not really love her and he did not have connection with her, Samson knew that deep down inside, he was still a Hebrew. Samson knew that his identity was still back at home. He knew that deep down, even though he was married to this Philistine woman, he was still a child of God. He still knew the purpose and plan that God had for him. He knew deep down that he was still chosen by God. He was still consecrated and separated for a holy use and purpose. And so somehow he struggled with this. He struggled with this identity. You see, this was the struggle of Samson. While he hated the Philistines for what they did to God's people, he also loved them. While he wanted to destroy them and kill them, he also wanted to make friends with them and wanted to be, you know, looked up to by them. You see, Samson was a double-minded man. Samson was friends with the world while trying to maintain a relationship with God. And this is why the Holy Spirit could only move him at times. When Samson was with God, he was fulfilling God's purpose, the Holy Spirit could move him. But when Samson chose to go down into the land of the Philistines and began to mingle with the people there, guess what? The Holy Spirit could not move because Samson began to conform. Samson's mind began to to change. His values and principles began to decline. And when he was placed in that position, the Holy Spirit could not move him. The Holy Spirit could not work. You see, friends, it is the same for us. When we place ourselves in positions where the Holy Spirit cannot move us, then we will not be moved by the Holy Spirit. We will be moved by our own lust and pleasures and our thoughts and our intentions. But it's not because the Holy Spirit cannot work. It's because we place ourselves in positions that hinder the the, the working of the Holy Spirit. You see, many times in our lives, in our Christian lives, we try to be friends with the world while also trying to be friends with God. We think that we can be friends with the world and also have a relationship with God. But friends, let us not be deceived. This is not something that we can do. But you see, this is the reality. We are double-minded. You know, many times we may look at people living in the world and we may envy their life. We may be attracted to the food they eat, to the cars they drive, to the houses they live in, to the way they dress, to the way they live their lives. You know, we can look at ourselves as, as Christian or Adventist and think, you know, our lives is so boring compared to people in the world. They're having fun. They're living a great life. And look at me. Look at the way I'm dressed. Look at the way I'm eating. Look at the things I'm doing. People outside are watching movies while I'm reading my Bible. People outside are driving nice cars while I'm driving a cheap car. And we begin to envy the world. We begin to become attracted to the things of the world. 
And slowly but surely, when we mingle with people in the world, we become just like them. Just like Samson, we become double-minded. Deep down, we know that we are Christian, we're Adventists, we go to church, we greet each other, happy Sabbath, but when we're in the world, what happens, friends? Do we become a light to them, or do we start to blend in? Do we stand apart, or do we start to conform our ways to the ways of the world? You see, this is our struggle. This is our issue. And this is why we can relate to Samson. Because Samson's problem is not just lust and relationship. His problem was that he was double-minded. He wanted to be friends with the world and also be friends with God. And it's very evident that this cannot work. And that is why the Holy Spirit could only move him at times. See, friends, we must understand that when we live this way, the Holy, Sca- Holy Spirit cannot move us. The Holy Spirit can move us at times, but not all the time. Sometimes we will be you know, led by the Holy Spirit, we'll be faithful, we'll put God first, but then there are times where we would, where we would live in sin, where we would disobey God, where we would turn away from Him. And this causes us to have a spiritual roller coaster. Sometimes we're up, and then sometimes we're down. Sometimes we're on fire, and then sometimes we're cold. It's called being lukewarm. In the middle. Not hot, not cold. Just in the middle. Friends, this was the struggle of Samson. And this is our struggle today as well. As Christians, as people called by God, as people that are called to be sanctified and consecrated, this is our struggle. There is a natural tendency for us to conform to the world, to be friends with the world. But when we are friends with the world, the Holy Spirit cannot move us. The Holy Spirit can only shake us at times when really we should be shaken all the time. But notice what the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 4. It says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You see, the Bible, sa- the Bible tells us that friendship with the world is enmity with God. That word enmity means hatred. It's something that God hates. You see, God hates it when we try to be friends with the world and also try to be friends with Him. God would rather have us either all for Him or not at all. God doesn't like it when we are lukewarm. He doesn't like it when we are double-minded, when we are in the middle and we think that we can maintain both. Friends, God wants all of us or none at all. He wants all our heart or none at all. And so today we must make the decision. We must make the decision to be either all for God or none at all. Because God wants our full commitment. But today, we have this tendency to be double-minded. And we must be careful. We must overcome this. From the life of Samson, we can see what being friends with the world will lead to. Eventually, it will lead to our own destruction. Eventually, it will lead to our own spiritual downfall. And so this is something that we must overcome. Instead of blending in with the world, instead of being just like them, we are called to stand apart and we are called to be consecrated and sanctified. We are called to be a light to this world. But now, what is the remedy? What is the solution? How can we overcome this? Well, friends, it's simple. The book of James gives us this simple step to follow. James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. It says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. See, the Bible says that we must do what? Firstly, we must submit ourselves fully to God. And then we must resist the devil. It doesn't happen the other way. Many times we try to resist, we try to overcome on our own, and we fail miserably. But we must submit ourselves to God first. We must realize that only God can help us. 
in this condition. Only God can help us to overcome this struggle. Only God can help us to resist the devil to overcome the world. And so we must submit ourselves fully to Him. We must fully consecrate ourselves to Him. Each day, we must give our lives to Him. And when we surrender our lives, our will, our minds to God, for God to use us, for God to direct us, then God will help us, friends. Many times we try to resist on our own. Many times we leave God, and when we go in the world, instead of being a light to them, we become just like them. But today, God can help us to resist the devil. He can help us to overcome our double-mindedness. But we must submit ourselves to Him. And as we do so, God will cleanse our hearts. He will purify our minds. He will cleanse our hands. He will make us new. He will give us grace to overcome. He will help us to be sanctified, consecrated, different from the rest of the world. And so today, friends, we must ask Jesus to live in us. You see, God is calling us today to be separate. He's calling you and I as His chosen people to fulfill the purpose that He has set for our lives. God wants to use you and I for a holy use. But because of our sinful nature, we are always naturally inclined to the world. We're always naturally inclined to sin we will always conform to the ways of the world. And this is not something that we can overcome on our own. And today we must realize that. We must realize our helplessness and our hopelessness, and we must surrender ourselves fully to God so that He can help us. Friends, today God is calling you and I to submit ourselves fully to Him so that He can give us grace to overcome so that He can help us to resist, so that He can change our hearts and minds, and so that we can be moved by the Holy Spirit at all times. God wants to live in you and I today. And so friends, my question for all of us this morning is do you understand the struggle? Do you realize your helplessness when it comes to overcoming the world? Do you see that we are double-minded and we cannot overcome this on our own and only God can help us? Well, if you realize that, then friends, won't you surrender your lives to Him? Won't you fully submit to Him today so that He can use you and He can help you? Won't you allow Jesus to live in your life today? Remember that God is calling us to be different. He's calling us to be separate and consecrated. He's calling us to be a light to this world of darkness. <clears throat> but remember, the first step is that we must fully submit ourselves to Him. And we must allow Jesus to live in us today. And so let us pray and let us surrender our lives to Him even now. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank You so much for the reminder that we are double-minded that we have a tendency to conform to the world. Forgive us, Lord, for thinking that we can be friends with the world and also maintain a relationship with you. And today I'm asking that you would help us to fully submit to you. Lord, this is not something that we can overcome on our own. We need your help. We need your grace. We need you to help us to resist. And so I'm praying for each person here. May you help each one of us, Lord, today, even right now, to fully submit our lives to you so that you can help us, so that you can use us, so that you can purify our hearts and our minds, and so that you can help us to be different from the rest of the world. And Lord, I'm just asking that you would help us also daily to pray for the Holy Spirit to fill our lives so we can moved by the whole you can be moved by the Holy Spirit at all times and so that we can live our lives in accordance to your will so Lord we just surrender our lives into your hands may you help each one of us to resist and to overcome the world I thank you so much for hearing and for answering our prayers <clears throat> and I pray these things in Jesus name amen